South Carolina lawmakers returned to Columbia on Tuesday to tackle a plethora of issues from infrastructure to education. I talk one on one with State Senator Brian Adams of District 44, Charleston and Berkeley counties for this edition of Quentin's Close Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close Ups on Facebook. State Senator Brian Adams, welcome back to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate you greatly. Needless to say, you are State Senator uh, Brian Adams of District 44, which now covers parts of Charleston, Berkeley, and Dorchester counties. That's correct. For right now, it does. Yeah. So, with that addition to Dorchester County, Senator, what's new? What's now in District 42, 44, that is? Well, right now, 44 is um, it's, it's, it's going to change a little bit come uh, 2025. Uh, the only counties I'll be in at that time will be Berkeley and a little bit of Charleston. I'm losing all of my Dorchester area come come that that season, and um, so I won't have anything in Dorchester. So that's kind of the the newest thing. So some people that are you know uh, used to me being their senator, I will not be, and and some of that will change. It'll be uh, either Vernon Stevens yeah. from District 39 or uh, Senator Bennett from District. Oh my gosh, I forgot his district number, but <laughs> Senator Bennett's district. So, we love Sean, by the way. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, um, but, uh, so it'd be from one, they'd be covered by one of those two senators now. So right now, Senator, how many people, constituents wise, do you all have in your district altogether? Charleston, Berkeley, and Dorchester? About 113,000. Oof. And so yes. when you lose that and just have Charleston and Berkeley County, what, what will you have, 50,000? No, no, it'll still be about the same thing. So wow. because my population grew so much, mm. we had to change. And that's, that's what's happened in the growth areas between like York, Myrtle Beach, the Charleston area. There's been so much, so much growth mm. that our um, districts had to, had to be condensed a little bit because what they do is the population in the state grows like I think it's 5.25 million people. So they take that and divide that between 46, and that's how our lines are drawn up. So that's how we end up with the new Senate District 20 down here in the Charleston area. Right. Wow. Yeah. So how much has your particular district grown, grown over the past two years? Um, roughly over the last uh, 10 years, it's grown about 30,000 people. Do you all know exactly where these people are coming from? Well, they're coming from all over. I mean, and, and really, I got a kind of a funny story. Okay. So I was at a community meeting in... Uh, the Cane Bay area, which will not be mine in 2025, but I was up there at a community meeting, and there was a gentleman that comes up, and he had his tax bill in his hand, and he's, he's moved here from New Jersey, he says, and he started complaining about his tax bill, and what was funny about it is, he kept coming to me, he goes, you're telling me my taxes were supposed to be cheaper here in South Carolina. I looked at his tax bill, and I said, you know that's for the year, right? He goes, oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> So it was a big difference for him, yeah. and it, it was great, you know, but a lot of people are coming from up north. They're coming mm. from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, wow. Wow. Ohio, and places like that. So wow. it's, uh, it's, it's different, and, are, and, are, and we are getting a lot of growth from the north. Wow. So where do you see that pace of growth heading in the next 10 years? I don't know if we're going to slow down. Um, it's, it's hard to, to stop people from moving into different states and stuff. Uh, and they, they, they are coming here. I mean, we have, one, we have great weather. Two, you can't beat South Carolina. You've got the mountains and you've got the ocean. Um, we've got some beautiful cities. We've got historical cities like Charleston. We've got beautiful cities like Columbia and Greenville and that. I mean, it's really hard to beat uh, our places. If you want to go to spring break, you've got Myrtle Beach. So we got it all. You know, we've got great history here. And and um, great taxes and, and friendly people. And I think that's the biggest thing that, that people come to South Carolina for is our friendly people. Uh, so that's just kind of interesting. You know, I have people ask me all the time, why, why is South Carolinians so afraid of people moving here? We don't want you to change who we are. We like asking you, how are you doing? Holding the door for you. Engaging in a conversation where people from the big cities and stuff like Atlantic City or Pittsburgh or those places, they're not used to engaging in conversation. We like it. It's, it's amazing. I, I joked with uh, somebody the other day. I said, 15 years ago, I hardly ever heard a horn honk. 
Now I go down the road, everybody's hopping a horn. We didn't do that in South Carolina. We were, we, if it took us a little time to get to work, we took our time. Right. We were never in a rush. And we have just steadily started growing into this rush. And, um, and, and that's the part that I think scares everybody. We don't want to lose our hospitality here in South Carolina. How do you then grow District 44 with smart growth? Well, I think you, you try and be ahead of it. But the problem is sometimes the growth comes in so fast, it, it's almost like we're always chasing our tail. Mm -hmm. um, we weren't expecting the growth to, to, to explode the way it exploded. Um, and then we're playing catch up from the roads to schools to public safety to uh, public services of some sort. So those things are hard to stay up with. And I think that's always a challenge. Um, Cause at one, at, in one mindset, you don't want to over prepare and that growth don't happen. And then you got these expenses that you can no longer afford. That's happened in a lot of towns across America that they thought were going to happen or they lost their population and now they can't afford some of the things that they had to grow to. So it's a really good balancing act that you have to do. And um, we have to make good common sense decisions. Sometimes it's not always good. Sometimes it's great. So that's, and that's, that's how you kind of work through some of those things. And I, I know this is a very silly question, State Senator, but in your district, uh, how much population did you all lose last year? In my day, we didn't lose any population. We grew. We grew. We grew. And State Senator, let me ask you, how much did your po population grow by last year? Um, I, I don't know last year, but over the last 10 years, it grew about 30,000. Wow. So now wow. it's not just my district. That was right. Senator Grooms' district, mm, oh yeah. in his district, oh districts yeah. up in York County, districts over in Myrtle Beach. Mm. We all had extreme growth over that 10-year period, and that's what's causing a lot of the, the uh, districts to change. Wow. <sighs> Let me talk to you about some of the things that you just mentioned, public safety, infrastructure, roads. Right. Because Governor McMaster just said this, I think, six days ago on Twitter, if I'm not mistaken. He said this quote. 2023 was the second best year for economic development in the state's history with 9.22.9.2 billion in new capital investment and more than 14,000 new jobs announced. Once again, as he says, South Carolina has proven that it is among the best places in the world to do business. So let me ask you this, Senator, are any of those investments in jobs in infrastructure? Yes. So we we're actually ahead of schedule for widening I-26 to Columbia. We were thinking it was going to take about 10 years. We're on track to have that completed by seven years. Um, you see the growth going up there. There's going to be some more exits and interchanges going up as well, once again, because of the growth. But we need more exits up that way so people aren't fighting down the highways. They can get to the interstate a lot quicker. Um, so there, the infrastructure is coming, and it is happening a lot faster than we thought. And uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful for, for all that. Now, when you... Before you can, before you widen I twenty six. Well, let me ask you this then: How many exits do you need right now for that area that you actually represent? So I think there's going to be an additional two going in up. It's not really in my area; it's, it's north of my area. Mm -hmm. But I think there's an additional two exits that are going up in that direction, and I think that'll help out relieve some of the highways coming down from that part of the county down through the lower part of the county, trying to get down to Charleston or North Charleston. So that'll help out a lot. And when do you ex ex expect, expect or anticipate, I should say the better word, those exits to actually uh, come about? I'm not, I'm, I'm not exactly sure the, the, the finish date for those. I just know that that section of interstate from the top of Jedburgh, where oh, yes. it just stops going from three lane, and it's going to continue on towards Columbia. Mm -hmm. That was an all-round project. It's supposed to be done in 10 years. They said it's ahead of schedule and should be done in seven. So... We're, we're, we're doing things right. We're getting things some done. And we're still uh, doing things on, on the highways as well, trying to get a lot of those resurfaced and, and, and help counties wherever we can help them out. Now, when you help those counties, how much money are you all giving to them and how much money are they giving back to the state for this? So the, the county's all different depending on their population, road use and all that. There's a calculation that the DOT uses, and I'm not, I'm not right. a math person. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so I'll leave that into sure, their hands. Sure, sure, and then sure. we kind of, what we try and do is every year, or every couple of years, we try and see because of the population growth, we want that to grow as well to where it can go into those funds and the counties and them can use them.
So now that this particular project, as far as widening I-26, is obviously finishing ahead of schedule, how much money did that save the state of South Carolina? That would be millions. I'm, I don't know the exact amount, but that would be millions. When you're able to finish things ahead of schedule, that always saves millions because of just the cost of the materials alone is always going up. And listen, construction materials is no different than the inflation on our groceries. Construction materials have the same type of inflation. So if we can finish any job early, it always saves the state and counties money. Now that we have inflation, State Senator uh, Brian Adams, let me ask you, how much has that actually cost the state more because of this? Well, I think it's the, the value is always going to go up. When the inflation goes up, everything goes up. So um, I don't know the exact amount. Um, I think that'd be something for our directors through DOT to answer. But I mean, that that is that any time inflation cost of anything goes up is going to drive the cost of what we're doing up. And so that's always fluctuating and moving around. Wow. So now that we and, and how much. So now with that being obviously with the uh, widening of I-26 that is being ahead of the schedule. When exactly do you hope that will actually open to the public? Well, within seven years, like I said, I'm hoping yes, that's done within sir. seven years. And it'll be in stages. They well, always do it so many miles, and it kind of creeps up the interstate that way. So it won't be like they do it all at one time. They right. do it in increments, and they kind of move up the interstate. Wow. So what stage are we in right now, in particularly in your area, nearby your area? Well, they started the construction side above the Jedburgh side, and they're moving up. And then they already started in other sections, and they're moving down. Okay, gotcha. Yes, I'm be, yes sir. Yes, sir. And, and going back, obviously, to what uh, Governor McMaster said, he said 2023 was the second best year for economic development in the state history. So let me ask you, uh, probably an irrelevant question, how should the state continue to innovate and develop a school choice program that funds students and not a government-controlled system? Ask me that question one more time. Yes, sir. How should the state continue to innovate and develop a school choice program that funds students and actually not a government control system? I think we just need to look at the, how, how well the first program takes, takes hold, see how it's utilized, and then we kind of need to expand on that. It's like any, any type of project. So when you're working in everything, somebody comes up with a new idea, you try that new idea. If it doesn't work, you either scrap it. If it does work or you need some tweaks, you tweak it. This is the same thing. So it's an idea, and we try and help it, help it out if it can. And if, and if school choice works and we see the growth and it's helping out students, then then we work with it. If it needs some tweaking, we tweak it. If it's no good, then we try and work, you know, show that it doesn't work. We have to try something else. I think that's that's the, I think that's what we should do in government. We should always kind of look at these things. If they work, help it. If they don't work, let's move on to something else. Where do you see the growth in school choice here in South Carolina? I think that that would be for, you know, the, the, the people of South Carolina, the parents of South Carolina show us. And if, if it takes off and does well and they ask for more, then I think we should give them more. If they say, no, this isn't working, then, then I think it's ultimately up to them. And we kind of follow their lead on that. Where do you see that growth in school choice happening in the state of South Carolina? I think you can see it almost anywhere in the state. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think you can see it in the rural areas as well as the, the areas that are blown up with population. Um, I think uh, you could, you really could see it anywhere where there, you have a, a group of parents that want that option and they can reach out to different schools or in that and it gives them the ability to, to travel and go to the schools. Uh, do you see any of that happening here in the low country? So far, we're, we're seeing a little bit of it. I mean, I don't think um, it's really been long enough for to test anything. So we'll kind of wait and see what's, what's going on with it. Now, in generality, Senator, where should tweaks happen with school choice? I know I'm going ahead of myself here. Say that again? Yeah, I know I'm probably going ahead of myself. But what tweaks do you see happening when it comes to school choice? Maybe it, uh, allowing additional students to mm -hmm. be able to go. Uh, right now, it's capped at 15,000. Right. And uh, so, as you can see it grow from there, if it, if it fills up and goes, then I think you can raise that school cap mm. and kind of see what happens. See what happens. Yeah. And, uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just saying a lot of states, do, we, we kind of follow suit 
And I think a lot of states have shown 15,000 and then, and then it'll grow. And then usually they, they top out somewhere about 20, 25,000 and that's about it. And uh, so we can kind of see if that's going to be the same thing for us. So when do you expect South Carolina to top out? Oh, I don't know. I think that goes right back to the parents. If it, if it works, then new spreads and word of mouth spreads and more parents might get involved. Wow. And, and, and let me go back, obviously, to the economy, because Governor McMaster also said this. Uh, he said this a quote on Twitter. According to the United States Census Bureau, South Carolina is the fastest growing state in the nation, as you just mentioned. He says South Carolina is the field of opportunity. And when combined with our rich culture, beautiful landscapes and strong economy, there's no better place in the world to call home, unquote. So how long can this actually continue, Senator, with unsustainable growth? Uh, I guess it can continue until people quit moving here. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's any real way of, I mean, you can't stop it. I mean, we're America. So people have the right to move where they want to move in America. And, um, and we have the freedoms to kind of come and go as you please. And by all means, if you're right now, if you're living in Iowa and you're, you're battling negative 15 degrees, I'd be in South Carolina too. <laughs> so it all depends on, on when do people decide they don't want to move here anymore. So that could be 10, 15, 20, could be two years. It just that kind of depends on people. And, and let me go back to what you mentioned earlier, infrastructure, because he said this too, uh, the governor that is, today, I will recommend a 500 million investment in our state bridges. Too many are in such disrepair that that requires restrictions, rendered them unuseless for commercial trucking, school buses, uh, fire trucks needed to serve our state's growing population. So where in South Carolina is this funding actually coming from? Well, and so that's the whole thing. I have to, I'd have to work with finance and try and find out, is that a feasible amount? Is it too low, too high? Do we know where it's going to come from? So those are things we all have to look at. And I think it's, it's kind of like when you're going to look for a car, we all start at the top. <laughs> we, want a, we want a car, we want to be fully loaded, to have everything in it. Then we get there and we start seeing the price of this and the price of that, and we start lowering our expectations a little bit. So I think this is kind of the same thing. We want this. In reality, our state can't handle that. We have to, we have to come down and, and come to a median somewhere. So that's what we have to do, kind of look at everything, put everything together, and kind of go from there. And I know my brother just did that a couple of months ago when he was looking for a car. But and oh, yeah. let me tell the viewers, I don't drive, don't know how to drive, so I'm okay. <laughs> But let me go back, Senator. Uh, how about if the state just look at the assessments, the priority levels, and the bids first before just allocating money? Well, and, and we, we get the bids and stuff. Um, we, we do all that. Uh, so, and we get it. And by the time you, you what, what happens a lot of times is by the time we get the personnel, the materials, and all that going, the price sometimes is going to change a little bit. So that's why it's always important get everything in order, get the bids, get the, the, the red tape cleared out of the way. And if you can get ahead of schedule, that brings those prices down. Hmm. So isn't this so-called investment, Senator, likely a drop in the bucket compared to the actual cost, as you just mentioned, of repairing and maintaining bridges? Once again, I'd have to look, I'd have to look at it and talk to finance people. I really would. I'm not. A, I'm not in the finance committee. Okay. So I'd have to look at some of that thing, some of those things, and some of those numbers to see exactly where we'd be at with that. And as you just mentioned, Senator, the population obviously is growing in South Carolina, particularly here in the Low Country. So why doesn't the governor and I would we'll love to talk to him on Quintus Close Ups one day? But why not put some of that money towards, say, for instance, public transportation? Well, and I think public transportation is being looked at. I mean. The, um, I think they're looking at doing a bus lane oh, yeah. coming up rivers. And, yeah. and so I think that's going to help out. Um, so not that public transportation isn't being looked at. We just, Americans love their cars. And we have shown across this country where there is public transportation. I will drive by myself in my car before I go down and take a bus or a tram or something like that because I like my car. So um, that's one we got to convince people to take to carpool, tr uh, take public transportation, and things like that. That's that's a struggle, but it's not that we don't look for public transportation. We do do for different things, but 
So many things just uh, haven't come to fruition yet. I do know that they're looking at, it, or if not already planning, the bus lanes through Charleston and that coming up. So that and that will help out a lot. Well, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, Senator, can you actually convince the state senate and the House and maybe the governor? And I'm just looking at it from you know <laughs> a realistic standpoint, and looking at it from obviously other states, but maybe add some toll roads here in South Carolina. Yeah, um, that that's come up before too. So you can't add tolls to existing interstates. Mm. Um, so and uh, it's not that um, I think we we need toll roads right now. I think right now our funding for our roads is is in place, and that we're we are we're getting out there and we're we're getting some of these projects done, and we're actually ahead of schedule, like I said, on the interstate. So. Uh, I think it is a matter of just trying to get some of these projects done and getting them getting them going. Why was our transportation infrastructure, Senator, allowed to get this bad for so long? I just think it was um, different priorities at the time, something different. Maybe that I wasn't, you know, years ago, right. they, they uh, maybe this wasn't one of their priorities at the time. Maybe it was. And it, it grew so fast, they weren't expecting it that, to happen. So, and now we're, we've got a 10 year plan. Everything is working pretty well. Um, we, we're getting some roads resurfaced, like I said. So, um, like I said earlier, sometimes our planning isn't good planning and we have to readjust it. And I think that's what we've done. And we've done pretty well with that and getting everything going. What exactly will the state do with the uh, the four point nine billion over five years that is actually get coming from the infrastructure bill? Well, I think it'll be spread throughout the state. You know mm -hmm. what's needed, where it needs to go, and whether it's highways, roadways, um, the interstate, what it needs. And I think that's that's what will be applied to throughout the state. And it'll be it'll go to the states that need it the, or the roads that need it the most, the most, most traffic, less traffic. Now. Would getting rid of the personal property taxes on motor vehicles help with all of this infrastructure? I don't, I don't. Getting rid of it, I'm not quite sure. I'd have to look at that, you know, because the personal property tax, that's how our schools are funded and stuff like that, too, is through the, motor, or the vehicle tax. So we'd have to look at some of those things and see. Um, and that's, that's back to that financial area I'm not an expert on without sitting down and getting all the information from the experts. Now, I do, unfortunately, have to get into finances really quick because it, obviously the state budget, and that's a big topic right now, as you know, at State House. Uh, how much revenue, Senator, does the state actually need now to actually have, say, for instance, a balanced budget? Well, I mean, as you see, last year we gave back a tax cut. Right. The year before that, we gave back money with a tax cut. Um, I think we're doing what's right. We're looking at that every year. And the state is not to be making money. It is the purpose of the, the, the taxes are to keep a balanced budget, which we have. And we've been able to, over the last two fiscal years, give reduced taxes and send money back to the people. So I think we have to keep looking at that and keep adjusting until we have that balance. But we all, we're over. We, we, we take in more money than what we need. So that's why we keep giving it back. So um, I think the state's doing good with that, and we're doing right by uh, reducing, reducing taxes, and I think we're doing an excellent job with giving some money back to the people of the state. Now, how exactly should the House of Representatives revise the state's initial tax revenue estimate? That, that's going to be up to them. That's a whole different 126, 124 different people. <laughs> so, and, that's, and that's how legislation is supposed to work between them and us. Right. And then we, we put our minds together at the end and kind of come to a compromise and apply common sense and, and move forward. Wow. So uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking back to 2020. And, of course, I interviewed you when you ran for, uh, when you ran for the state Senate right. back on Quentin's post ups. But uh, how much state revenues have leveled off this year? after the increases during the pandemic? Well, the, the, uh, our, our surplus is definitely coming in every year has gone down. Mm -hmm. And we think a lot of that's gone to inflation. People are not uh, buying as much and things like that. So I think that is, that's going to start affecting us. So we kind of watch that, you know, um, and we have to apply that to our budget coming in every year because we don't want to go backwards. We don't want to go 
where we're spending more than what we're bringing in. And, and luckily, we're doing a good job and we're not doing that. Wow. Going back to that state budget for 2024, what adjustments should be made right now in your mind? I just think we have to watch it. We, we have to make sure that we have a balanced budget, that we're putting money where it needs to be, and we are funding what we need to fund. And um, the moment we start going over that, we have to start cutting something. We, we need to make sure that we don't spend more money than we're making. So where exactly is the money going? Where, well, where is exactly is the money going where it shouldn't go right now? Um, I don't know if there, I can point to any one thing. Mm. Uh, I think you have to watch and um, you speak to your people and say whether you agree or disagree. And then that's where the votes come in. That's when we're voting on things. You'll see senators and, and representatives decide, okay, I'm voting for this. I'm not voting for that. And so that's kind of what you have to go on. It's everybody's kind of personal preference and, and what they're dealing with and what they work with and what gets passed. Speaking of personal preference, uh, Senator, what items on your particular wish list for your district do you have right now? And which ones do you see potentially being trimmed because of all of this? Well, I don't know if I see anything being trimmed. Are you talking about bills or, or projects? Oh, projects. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't have any projects per se right now that are going on in the county. I mean, uh, we helped out Berkeley County with the, uh, some money with the, for a new courthouse. Yeah. And then um, that's pretty much it in the county that I'm on for a project. Okay. Uh, but in bills, in, in bills, I've, I've got several different bills out there. I'm, I'm hopeful for to see them move. But, uh, but that's kind of that's it for me and my projects in Berkeley County. Now, what bills are you currently looking to get passed in the Senate this year? Well, so uh, coming up, we were going to be talking about the ESG score hmm. uh, for banks. Oh, yeah. And uh, we got a bill coming up. We're going to discuss that uh, next week, as well as a, a prescription parental right bill coming up uh, next week as well. And I think those are, those are important bills and um, they're kind of some hot button issues for for us in talking to people. So um, those, those should be pretty interesting coming up next week. And, I, and, you know, later on down the line, I hope I can get you back on Quintus Close Up so we can talk more about that in depth. And I know Zoom's only giving me like five minutes. But I, I, I know one of the things that are being proposed in the state of house this year is something about, obviously, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, modernizing the tax code or trying to, you know, uh, adjust that. How does the state tax code reflect the economic changes and improve its competitive com uh, composure, that is? You, you like to ask me these money questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I have, when it comes to like taxes and things, I always have to go to them and sit down okay. and ask them the questions because oh. I am not a numbers guy. Okay. My background is, is law enforcement and things like that. And when it starts to come to numbers, this is how simple. I like to sit down in front of them. They explain everything to me. And I, I get it from three or four different people. Sure. If my right hand, my right number is bigger than my left number, I'm good to go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no worries. Well, obviously, since you're in law enforcement, let me talk to you. Obviously, as you mentioned, the population in your, in your district is growing. So what public safety concerns do you have right now for your district? Well, my public safety concerns are I want to make sure that our law enforcement officers are supported and we get more of them out there. We are short across the state of law enforcement officers. We have to get more officers on the street and we have to start showing them support so we can get them back out there and provide safety for us. Um, so that, that's one of my major main concerns with them is we have to get more out there because all departments are short. Oh. Now, in your particular district, Senator, how many, say for instance, law enforcement officers do you actually need now? Well, I mean, right now there's there's departments that are you know ten, twenty down. You got some that are you know maybe five down, but are a smaller department. That five down hurts them more than the twenty down in a big department. Yeah. So, you know, every every department's a little bit different, so you have to look at it. But um, all departments are struggling to keep officers um, within them because uh, it's just it's it's just not the the profession a lot of people think of going to, you know, when they're, when they have the ability to do it. 
Uh, and I hope to get back to you with that as well. But let me go back to something else that is also a big topic in the state house, and it kind of has something to do with enforcing the law, and that is streamlining the election process. Let me ask you, State Senator, how can the state poll workers' time and taxpayers' dollars be actually, uh, you know, worked out while minimizing the risk of error and maintaining audibility? Well, and that's the thing. So I would like to see the counties. We have to do some more audits. Right now, they're required to do three, pick three precincts, and they do three of those to make sure everything is, is comes up right. Um, so I think that's an important step to add more audits per county, and I, I think that would help create that, that safety effect to help out with that. Um, I think we do a good job with uh, uh, an ID required or driver's license required, and then you go in and you go through and they and they, that's, that's a safety part. Um, so I think all those, another thing that we, we got rid of was the ballot harvesting. That's, right. that's a, that was an area of, of great contestation because you got people would go out to homes and they would help them fill out their voter registration and they would be allowed to bring in 2,000 ballots and drop them off. Where now we've reduced that to where now you can only drop off five and they got to be family members. So. Right. I think that stopped a lot of that. And let me tell you, that's, that was a great area of, of concern for a lot of people was the ballot harvesting. So that was one of the things we got rid of so or reduced it a good bit. And, and, and where was that the highest in your district as far as ballot harvesting? You know, I, it's, it's, I don't know if I really had a problem in my district with ballot harvesting. Um, so, uh, but it does occur, and I couldn't tell you exactly where you'd have to go probably talk to the election board and see if they ha had anything about with that. And, and Senator, I want to ask you this, you know, interesting question. What ideal management, uh, management software that is can actually, should the state use that is to re-engineer its election process? I'm not sure what software, um, you're talking about the computers yes, that sir. they use for the voting machines. Yes, sure, sir. Well, I don't think anything should be coming from China. I don't want anything hooked up to the internet. Um, but the way we do it, the, the paper ballot plus yes. the computer ballot, right. and then we can compare the two and make sure everything matches up. I like the system, um, but there's always room for improvement and stuff. So I think if we looked at the machines and made sure they weren't formulated and, and engineered in China, and uh, we have the ability to to check it off with the paper ballot as well as the electronic side of the ballot, I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. And that brings me to this next question. Would it be ideal for the state of South Carolina to actually track votes with 12 handwritten logs used for various ballot processes that can actually be later re-entered into a master polling, say, for instance, spreadsheet? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to look at it a little bit. I think... I think the system we have where we're actually using a paper ballot, you can compare it and you look at it. And then we have the two to look at and make sure. And then at the end of the night, if you have 3,000 paper ballots and you have 3,001 electronic votes, why is that not right? You know, or if you have 3,000 paper ballots and 3,000 votes, do we know everything is coming up right? So you have to look at all those. And I think uh, um, we can continue tweaking and do what we need to do to make it safer. State Senator Brian Adams, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you, Quentin. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome.